Welcome to another enlightening episode of uh, Talent Ed, where the podcast where education meets innovation, talent shines through every store. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Scanson. Today, we are diving deep into a topic that resonates with every educator and professional out there, the undeniable impact of happiness on our well-being and a relentless pursuit of fulfillment. And we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming a very special guest to our show, someone who's made it her life's mission to inspire, uplift, transform. She's cel- a celebrated motivational speaker. She's an educator. She uh, and happiness affectionado whose infectious energy is about to grace our airwaves, Kim, Kim Strobel. Kim, thank you for joining us. Your journey is a compelling and inspiring. And I want to ask you, are you ready to spread some joy and wisdom to our listeners today? I am ready. I'm ready, Eric. It's 80 degrees here, sunny. I'm feeling good. Let's go. Oh. Kim, where where are you talking to us from? Where in the heck is it 80 degrees today? Well, it's atypical weather, but Southern Indiana. I live in a very small little town called Tell City. I'm five minutes from the Kentucky border. If you hear my good old Southern accent, that is why. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that helps place that for sure. Um, I want to talk, I want to get right into it, Kim, because this is a really important topic, I think, right now for so many people. Um, there's so much, uh, what would we call it, anti-happiness, you know, like happening around us. Um, can you share with us a moment when you realized that happiness was more than an emotion, but a powerful tool for transformation? And maybe even specifically, what does that mean in the education sector? Yeah, well, for me, my own happiness journey actually started 20 some years ago. Um, This is a story I kind of tell on the stage because I think it's really easy to kind of, like you said, hear this intro bio, think that I have it all together and that I travel the country and do all this big stuff. And I do. But, um, you know, sometimes a person's pain gets to have the opportunity to to be turned into purpose. And so I tell people that I lived a lot of dark years. I suffered from panic disorder, um, which is a very debilitating anxiety Mm -hmm. disorder. Um, And so there were moments and times in my adult life and even years where I struggled to do the simplest of things, drive my car five minutes to Walmart or lo and behold, have to actually walk into Walmart, walk to my mailbox. Um, Those things were such a suffering Um, and a feeling of deep inadequacy in my life. But um, while I, you know, sometimes despise panic disorder and what it did to me, I've also learned that it's my greatest gift because it allowed me to dig into kind of the self-help field 20 years ago and say, okay, how do I start to create a life and take responsibility for my life from the inside out. So what is the work that I have to do Mm -hmm. on the inside of myself to be able to get the outer results? And when I started reading about this, um, I just became on fire with it. And then maybe 15 years ago, I started studying happiness in particular, and it gave me a lot. it, It helped me understand where we are in regards of that. And people think that happiness is like some end point, right? Like Mm -hmm. I just, I I just need to arrive at happiness. Someday it's going to happen. And it's not, I mean, life is polarity. Mm -hmm. We are a mixture of happiness and unhappiness. Um, But it's understanding that we all have this ability to get happier, regardless of the circumstances we're in. And in particular, you know, as a former fourth grade teacher, um, I always say I, I left the glass doors every day with my head down, my shoulders slumped, kind of feeling like, you know, once again, um, I didn't fare well today. You know, I missed I, I, mm-hmm. I maybe I did 99 things right. And I really screwed up with this student or this lesson or this uh, exchange with a parent. And I would just focus on what I did wrong versus the 99 things that I did right. And I started to think about how do we start to value ourselves as educators? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? And my goodness, how can we start to give ourselves some grace along the way? And I'm a straight shooter, Eric. 
this profession can completely suck the life out of you. It really can. Mm -hmm. And I'm honest about that. I, I think that's really great advice, especially as educators, when it's a time where, where we don't feel supported when, when the world is tough, right. And and what are you going to do about that? And you have that own control. You have that control. And I love what you said, that it is not a destination. It is a continuum, right? We can always be happier. Yeah. In that yeah. Continuum. And we're going to have moments, you know, where we step, I always tell people like, we're going to go in the gutter. We're going to have bad things happen. We're going to have struggles. But my goal is to teach you how to get out of the gutter quicker. And I know the research about how happiness actually affects our performance at work, which is Mm -hmm. also really astounding. And I want to give you a stat that I read recently, Eric. It it was saying that antidepressants are prescribed at a rate of 400 times more than they were 20 years ago. Oh, 400 times more. So as Americans... In particular, we are not getting happier. And, you know, I take an antidepressant for my anxiety disorder. So I'm not throwing shade mm-hmm. here. That's It's been a lifesaver for me. Um, but understanding that what we think makes us happier probably doesn't. And then where is that window of opportunity for all of us? You know, this would probably be a whole other episode, Kim, if we could get into it. Uh, and and the comparative nature that we have right now, we are constantly, constantly comparing. And you think about the opportunities that we have to compare now as to, you know, even 20 years ago. I mean, we see it all online, right? Everybody's painting a fake picture of their lives. Of I, I've told the story before of, of um, a friend and his family who were down by the lake and they took this they they posted this beautiful picture of the, the beautiful family. It was perfect sunset in the back. And I was telling him, I'm like, wow, that was a beautiful picture. You guys, you looks like you got it together. And he laughed. He's like, you know how many times we had to sit there for that photo? He goes, that is fake. He goes, that is is absolutely fake. He said, do not believe any of that. And I wanted to be like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Because I got caught into this thing like, wow, look at how awesome that life is, you know, standing in front of the lake. And um, yeah. I think you've made a really good point there because I think that we do not talk about the hard stuff enough and actually talking, like I always say, we're going through the halls, we're smiling at students, Mm -hmm. we're smiling at our coworkers, you know, and then we're going home with this feeling of defeat or depression or anxiety or guilt and, or irritability. And we're it, because we're not talking about the hard stuff in education, Mm -hmm. Feel like we're alone on an island and what i have found is that when we bring um those experiences to the forefront we begin to create connectivity with one another mm-hmm. and again that's you know when i step on a i i, I stepped on a stage in august with six thousand people and with you know i thought i got all these people looking at me and i they hear this amazing introduction about all these accomplishments and i thought to myself watch what happens to the crowd when you let them know Kim who you really Mm -hmm. are and it's the entire crowd just all of a sudden is like okay she's she is me too Mm -hmm. yeah authenticity right we we don't give it enough credit authenticity uh, vulnerability I mean these are leadership qualities that people love and I think it's because there's not enough of it it's a it's a scarcity mindset around those two uh I have to talk about happiness um, I, I read this somewhere or heard it somewhere. I can't remember, but it was basically this study of uh, they put people on a train and they they asked people to talk to the strangers and then they separated them out to people who didn't talk to anybody. And the idea was that the, the, the train company wanted to make a more private experience for people because that's what they thought was was better for people. And once they did the study, they found out that the people who were actually like open and talk to strangers and talk to the people next to them and had connection, they were happier at the end of their train ride. And then what did the the train company do anyway? They made private cars. I'm like, what are you doing? Like it was right in front of you. That is so funny that you bring this up because I was just uh, telling my husband, and this is not to make introverts feel bad about themselves because they certainly have their unique set of gifts, but um, I'm reading this book by Arthur Brooks and Oprah right now called, um, 
Oh goodness. I'm terrible. Build the life you love or something. It's Mm -hmm. most recent book. And he says that extroverts have higher correlations of happiness than introverts. And it's because extroverts are willing to make those connections Mm -hmm. with others and create more of those social dynamics than an introvert is. Again, We do not need everybody to be an extrovert. Extroverts are not better than introverts. I've learned so much from my husband who is an introvert. And in fact, he's taught me how to be very happy with my own company. But um, I thought that was interesting. And it gets into what you were saying, that social connection. It's related for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, let's come back to this, uh, this experience that you had as both teacher, curriculum director, and happiness. What are some of the immediate changes that you've witnessed in classrooms where educators maybe prioritize their own well-being, their own happiness? Like, like what do you see with that? Or what have you seen with that? You know, I, I'm just going to go on record and say that I saw so many teachers who were, you know, working till 5, 5, 30, 6 o'clock every night. I saw cars in the parking lot on the weekends. Um And I do believe, Eric, that that has even been exasperated since I last had my own classroom years ago. Um, But I will say that I was the teacher who got out the door by four almost every day. And I was an anomaly. And my motivation was simply that I had a little boy at home waiting for me and Mm -hmm. was hoping to have his fishing pole over by the creek or jump on the trampoline you know, by four o'clock every day. And so I had great motivation to get out the door, but I think it sometimes feels almost impossible to educators right now, but there is so much research uh, that supports that, you know, when we put our happiness at the forefront of our life, we begin to change every other indicator level. And let me give you a piece of research um, that is really driving this idea that that happiness and well-being need to come to the forefront for our students and for the people who are in charge of teaching those students. Um, What we know is that a brain at positive versus negative, neutral, or stressed, a brain at positive is 31% more productive. Whoa, that's a big number. Yeah. So if we had an app, you had an app on your phone and it registered all the employees on your building and in your building and you could click on that throughout the day. How many times would it show, you know, this teacher's at negative, this teacher's at stress, Mm -hmm. this teacher. And what do we do? What do we do when we're stressed? We we put our head to the grindstone and we say, I can't leave until I get this done. I have to finish this. I'm never I'm going to take all this home. I got to get all this grading done, whatever it might be. So what happens is we begin to actually lose productivity. And in fact, they did a study that if you work 50 hours a week on average, that that most humans get about 37 hours of useful work out of that, you know, because we're distracted, mm-hmm. we're doing different things. So 50 hours produces 37 hours of useful work. If you just push it five more hours, if you're just like, I can't, I, five more hours, you push it to 55 And now you've lost seven hours. So now you're at 30 hours. So you worked five hours and you lost seven, you know? Uh, That is some math that doesn't work, right? That that does not work. And and we know that when we can teach employees, and and I want to make sure I'm not preaching toxic positivity. I can't stand toxic positivity. Like we've got to, you know, I think we inadvertently do it in schools. We're like, show up and be the best for your kids. Kids mm-hmm, deserve mm-hmm. the best of you. And it, or kids deserve the best. And I'm over here going, you know what? Teachers deserve the best. Mm-hmm. Because if I can't get my teachers to be their best, they are not going to be able to show up for their students. So let's start with the teachers and the teacher leaders and the administrators. And let's make sure that we're doing due diligence. And we're not just preaching mental health, that we're actually offering the supportive pieces. Um, so when when I say I want to make sure that, you know, a brain that positive, I, I, I'm understanding that we, we're allowed to have our so-called, mm-hmm. I don't like to call them negative feelings, heavy feelings. We're allowed to feel anger and frustration. Those deserve to take up space in you. But what we know how to do is to pivot out of those a little bit quicker. And so not only are we 31% more productive, Eric, when our brain's at positive, but 
our, bra- our, our employees are 10 times more engaged in their job. Wow. I mean, th- there's a lesson in nature here, right? So the when the mother bear is is in the woods with the cubs, mother bear eats the berries first, right? She feeds herself first so that she can take care of the babies. Yeah. Same concept, right? Is, is it that is, right? but we have a culture that says that's selfish. That's it's selfish. not how we operate. That's not being a good human. And so I think a lot of it is breaking those barriers and those old social scripts down Mm -hmm. and understanding that when you make your, I mean, let's be honest, the most important relationship you have in the whole wide world is the relationship that you have with yourself. Mm -hmm. So if we're not taking care of ourselves, then, and I know people hear this and and by the way, I am so, I can't, I I can't stand the word self-care. I mean, to me, that's a terrible word to even say to teachers. You know, it's like, and I wrote an entire chapter on this in my book that that will be coming out in 2024. But quit telling teachers to like go get a massage or take a walk around the block or take a few quick breaths or take a bubble bath. Like, look, that is not going to make your job mm-hmm. less hard come Monday morning. That that is not good advice. I like to call it radical wellness because it when we're really talking about wellness, when we're really talking about so called self care. We're really talking about things that are hard and messy, like creating boundaries in your life, Mm -hmm. you know, saying I'm getting out the door, you know, and if it, you know, it's worth it to me because of what I get back in the other parts of my life. Um, And so, again, I think we have to be really careful with the type of cultures that we are inadvertently Mm -hmm. exasperating in in the schools. Well, well, we're facing a burnout crisis, right? There's that compared. Uh, coupled with with a shortage and they're interrelated right Uh, so thinking about your message around happiness kim um and i'm even thinking about like education leadership positions can often be like a lonely space oh they're Uh, like the stepchild really they're all by um, themselves yeah i mean what advice do you have to educational leaders or um, maybe how would you tailor your message around happiness to these professionals who may be forced or facing burnout in their careers? Yeah, well, I would love to just give you the happiness research because I feel like that is such a pillar to understanding where we can go from here, because many times that kind of blows people's mind. So what we know is that as human beings, we have what's called a set baseline happiness level. So maybe my baseline is here, Eric, Mm -hmm. and maybe yours is a little bit higher. And so let's say that something good happens in our life. Like, uh, you know, our kid gets into the college they wanted to get in. We get a new job. We get a new house. We get married, whatever it is. Our happiness level does go up for a period of time. Maybe it goes up for two days, two weeks, two hours. But what we know is that eventually it's going to reset right Mm. back to whatever your baseline is. Now, what's interesting is the same is true for when we endure difficult things in our life. The research proves over and over again that as humans, we can endure loss, illness, grief, uh, challenges, adversities, and that our happiness levels will dip but that for most humans, they will reset. And if you're like me, you fight a little bit with the researcher. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I don't know. There's certain things that I think if those things happen to me, I I might not ever regain my level of happiness, but I see evidence just like you probably do of people who have endured Mm -hmm. some terrible atrocities. Terrible. Yes. And And they, they reset, they go on to live joy filled, meaning filled lives. So then the big question becomes, okay, well, Kim, why is your happiness level baseline different than mine? And where does that come from? So I want you to think of your happiness as a pie chart, Eric. And what we know is that 50% of your long-term happiness is genetic. It comes from your mom or your dad Mm. mixture of both. And Eric, when I tell this to the crowd, I will see 80% of the heads drop and people will literally be thinking, I am so screwed. (laughs) No. But there is a genetic disposition. I always say I was born to like this super loving, caring, nurturing mother. Um, But like that woman, her brain scans for things that are wrong. It's just like her brain is just wired to pick Mm -hmm. up everything that's wrong. And then my hat, my dad is like this happy go lucky guy. So nothing, my mom's not a less human. Her brain is wired to pick that up 
more times than not. And she doesn't listen to her daughter, who's a happiness coach that tells her how to rewire her <laughs> brain. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, you know, it is hard to be a prophet in your own land, right? Oh, and that's that's a true statement. So 50% is genetic. Now, what I find really kind of fascinating that was mind blowing when I first learned about it is that only 10% of our long-term happiness comes from our external circumstances. Mm. Only 10%. So what's an external circumstance? Okay. Are you married, single, divorced, or widowed? What kind of job do you have? What kind of money do you make? What are your fam What? How did you mm -hmm. grow up? Were you, did you grow up in a divorce family, a, a nuclear, nuclear family? What happened to you when you were a childhood? What were your um, income? You know, all of these things, you can throw them all together and they only account for about 10% of long-term happiness. Wow. That is now what we're sold. It's At not. And, and you know what, Eric, if, if my husband leaves me tomorrow, it's going to rob me of more than 10% of my happiness for a while. But the issue is, is when it's robbing me, whatever, a year from now or two years from now, that's on me, right? Mm -hmm. That's me saying, oh, now I've stepped over here to victimhood instead of like taking my power back and understanding that I do not have to let this continue to rob me of my life. Mm -hmm. Now, I always, I always tell people this too. So you're married, right, Eric? I am. Yeah, me too. So I always say, hey, who's married? Hands go up. And I say the happiness research says that when you get married, you get a boost in happiness for about two years. Two years. <laughs> and then it goes back to baseline, Eric. And I'll tell people, Sometimes it gets worse for some of you. <laughs> yes, it, that's true. That is true. That's hilarious. So we like to have a little fun with the research. Uh, another one is, is that uh, the happiness research says that when you have kids, which if I'm not mistaken, how many do you have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> when you become a mom or a dad, you become just a tiny bit less happy for the rest of your life because your stress levels, yes. they still just a little bit of that well-being. And I don't think that ever changes from what I hear. My oldest right now is 16. And from what I hear, it, it actually never goes away. Yeah, I'm 49 and my mom will still say, text me when your plane lands, text yep. me when you pull in the driveway. I don't care what time because of the worry, you know, and I always say like my son, Spencer, Hands down, he's the biggest blessing and, and mm -hmm. joy of my life. But more times than not, that boy has stressed me out. Stress. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm so glad we can talk about happiness because part of for me, part of my happiness comes when I can laugh and find humor in things. It's a big part of uh, of my my value system. So I do have some questions for you, Kim, that um, I, I want to address. So I know, Kim, that with all seriousness, um, I have to ask you. You've rescued 187 dogs. Is this correct? It's actually 201 as of today. Oh my gosh. It keeps growing. It yep. keeps growing. Do you have a favorite uh, a favorite dog rescue story that uh, either is happy or humorous? Or, I mean, did, did you mistakenly um, grab a small horse in there? Okay. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Okay, but before we go there, I have to backtrack you just a minute. Because your listeners are wanting to know where the other 40% of happiness comes from. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Let's go back. So Let's we did 50% genetic, 10% circumstances. That leaves 40% of the pie, which means every human being, Eric, has the ability to increase their happiness levels by up to 40%. And it has to do with these three things, your actions, your thoughts, and your behaviors. Oh, my gosh. Eric, my, my, my Zoom thing has been doing this. When I do quotes, it, it gives me balloons or something in the background. Did you see that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was well-timed. It has something to do with when I move my hands, it will either do confetti or balloons. I don't know how. To... <gasps> what? What happened? Did I just do that? You did. You had confetti. What is, see, I don't know what. Is it this? It's every now and then it it, it recognizes uh, it. Oh my goodness. We got lots of stuff going on. Oh, I hope people are watching the video and not just listening because this is cracking us up. <laughs> right here. This has brought us some happiness. I'm gonna I'm gonna rewind and see my 
face when balloons started coming out because I <laughs> at first I thought they were real balloons I'm like that is well placed prop skim like wow oh my like, goodness so string. anyways I know we're on a time limit I just wanted to give that 40 percent that's the piece that I focus on with teachers schools school leaders all of that but going back to dogs okay here's the deal last week we had three find part of your 40 percent I, I, I know I know um there was a pit bull which of course those have such a bad rap but it was in the owner was physically beating it um mm. it was a year and a half it lived on a t uh, in a like in a basically a muddy mess the owner didn't feed it um very often and but it was just the friendliest sweetest guy and so the neighbor has been trying to take it dog food mm -hmm. and very concerned about it and reached out to me said Kim can you know I've talked the owner into releasing it but can you use your social media to find a home for it and so I don't know if you're on Facebook but well, here, I'm going to show you a picture, Eric, through the screen yes. so people can see it. So we got this dog placed in the most loving home last week. His name is changed from Titus to Chance. And I'm just going to show you the mother sent me this picture. Oh, that is his life today. And found happiness. He, uh, I know. And. You know, things like this can really distress me because I have a heart for, uh, this is him before, so you can see how he lived. Um, and now he's literally smiling. And so I get this, I have this empathetic heart for, mm -hmm. for kids and for dogs and for people in general, but um, it overwhelms me at times because I feel like I'm really the animal welfare mm -hmm. person in our area. Um, but it's like the starfish story, right? The guy's going, mm -hmm. the, going along and there's thousands of starfish on the seashore and he's picking up them and throwing them in the water. And somebody says, you're never, what are you doing? Like you're What's never, the point? yeah. And he says, you know what? It mattered to that one, didn't it? Mm -hmm. That is a beautiful story. I love that picture of that dog with the, with the baby. I know. You know, I just saw this, this other small video and they were, they were doing it to show prove a point of the the bond between the mother dog and the puppy um they were they were berating the the puppy and the mom was kind of like sheltering it and then the the person picked up a shoe like it was going to hit the the puppy and the mother like pushes the hand away oh, wow. and, and like uses its other one to like tuck it in like in that and you could see like it, was, it wasn't trying to run away but it was standing right by that yeah. puppy we underestimate and, animals. We sure yeah, do. Yeah. Well, let's talk about something else. So you're a runner. Is this correct? Is this correct? I, I cranked out eight miles this morning. That's impressive. I did not, um, Kim. I did well, not run. Know, I, I always, here's what I tell Eric. You know, I run 40 miles a week. I meditate 40 minutes a day. I take an anti-anxiety and um, like I'm still really highly wired. So um that running piece is such a mental aspect for me. Yeah. I mean, that's no easy feat. I, I do want you to share just a quick, do, do, have you ever had a, like a running mishap or unexpected adventure that, that you've encountered while running that brings you a laugh when you used to think about it? Um, well, I've almost been hit five times because mm -hmm. people just don't pay attention. So I've like had to like grab the car and push myself off of it at least one of those five times. Um, here's something interesting. I ran the Boston marathon a few years ago. Um, and that was an 89 degree heat. So I thought I was going to die. Um, but yeah, so running, I, honestly, sometimes dogs come every now and then come after me and I'm not very fearful of dogs, but, um, but I've learned to be a little fearful mm -hmm. when they are biting at my legs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kim, I think you need to probably practice the old, uh, the hood slide, like a police officer so that you're ready the next time that that happens like I think you could just practice in your driveway I'm sure everybody would appreciate one, that Eric. yeah I'll add that to my toolkit yeah um <laughs> last question we've heard about your professional accolades um but what what's a quirky or funny habit that keeps you grounded or maybe just makes you um let's see if I can get anything to happen uniquely Kim oh god Got him again. confetti Oh gosh. Okay. What is, I mean, I have some quirky habits that I've been, 
you know, sometimes, well, I don't know if this fits for what you're looking for, but I think I have a, l- a f- few layers of OCD. They, they come out in strange little ways. Like in the last few years, all of a sudden I have to cut all tags off from inside my clothes, which is just, I do not understand. Like, I, I don't have to have like everything completely straight in my house. Yeah, I don't yeah. have to have my floors clean all the time, but like for whatever reason, Every single tag, no, you know, they put tags everywhere, not just the back of clothes, mm-hmm. they're on the side. sides. Yeah, so that's everywhere. like a weird little thing. I'm like, I'm just like curious <laughs> that, and I have to keep my fingernails really, really short. Again, I do not know why. <laughs> There's like, can be no white on Now them. we know. Now we know. <laughs> Everybody, when you're sending Kim a, a Christmas gift or a birthday present, cut the tags off first. Okay. Exactly. Um, I want to recap just a little bit because we've talked a lot about um, happiness and controlling your own destiny here and that happiness is not a destination. It is a journey um, and it, it's always a continuum of can we be more happy, you know, happier. Um, I think you're just a great example of authenticity and vulnerability and I just really love what you bring and I would be so excited to see you in schools in talking with ed leaders and you already do this, but I, I would love to see more and more of you uh, around. Do you have a final call to action for our listeners today uh, in, in your area that uh, you want to ask them about? Well, you know, I think when I look at all the things that I do in my business, you know, we provide on-site professional development. My consultants go out in the field and do that, mm-hmm. um, live virtual workshops. But Eric, I like to be on the stage. I like to be in front of people and literally connect with them and watch them be able to truly see things click differently in their mind Mm -hmm. and then walk out and actually start to do life a little differently. And so um, right now I'm, you know, booking my 2024 keynotes. I think I told you before we jumped Mm -hmm. on that I took 19 flights in three weeks in the month of August. And so- Um, yeah, so I, I think that I would love the opportunity to really come and talk to people's staff about this idea of happiness and well-being. And uh, it's not like I'm going to be some sunshine sprinkles, mm-hmm. butterfly type of person, but we are also uh, we're going to we're going to have a lot of fun. It, it, we turn it up big time and people it's amazing yeah. to watch them leave, you know, and just have this spring in their step. Practical happiness with Kim Strobel, right? Like this is what we're talking about. Not toxic positivity, Mm -hmm. practical happiness. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for being with us today. And of course, um, if you're interested in booking Kim, you can can go to her website or you can contact School Pro and we'd be happy to get you hooked up as well. Um, And I have to say, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you with us today. And I know our listeners are going to walk away with not just a smile, but actionable, practical insights about happiness to bring back to the forefront of the professional lives. So with everybody else, uh, to our devoted listeners, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to lead with joy, teach with passion, uh, never stop learning. um, And then stay tuned for the next episode where we're going to continue to explore the fascinating world of talent in education or talent ed. And as I like to say, stay PKS. This is my sign off, positive, kind, and supportive. And we're going to add today for Kim, happy. (laughs) Goodbye for now.